bluffing about scientific support for Darwinism. According to Richard Dawkins, the evidence for the evolution of all life by Darwinian mechanisms, such as natural selection, is so strong that it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is either ignorant, stupid or insane. However, when we look into the credentials of those who oppose Darwinism, it quickly becomes clear that Dawkins is bluffing. David Belinsky, for example, has taught philosophy and mathematics at New York, Paris and Stanford universities, as well as conducting research and authoring books in the fields of biology, physics and mathematics. Yet, he is a harsh critic of Darwinism. This is what Berlinski says about the claim that critics of Darwinism are nothing more than religious fundamentalists. Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalists stands refuted by me. It's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. Uh, I know dozens of mathematicians who scratch their head and say, you guys think this is the way life originated. It's, absolutely a preposterous theory. And many, many very significant figures. John von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, just laughed at Darwinian theory. He hooted at it. Uh, so it's, it's perfectly absurd. This is a point in a polemical dispute. It's not a, a reasonable um, standard of criticism. Opposition to Darwinian theory is, I wouldn't say widespread, but there's a consistent group of people among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists who simply don't, uh, don't accept it, don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. Dawkins, along with many other Darwinists, also claims that there is no scientific controversy over evolution, since it is as firmly established as heliocentrism, claiming that, today the theory of evolution is about as much open to doubt as the theory that the Earth goes around the Sun. However, on this point too, Dawkins is bluffing. The truth is that scientific dissent over Darwin's theory is significant and growing. This dissent began to surface in 1985 when Australian biochemist Michael Denton published his book Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. This book outlined a number of purely scientific problems with Darwinian theory and prompted Harvard Law Professor Philip E. Johnson to investigate the issue and use his formidable legal skills to publish what is perhaps the finest critique of Darwinism, Darwin on Trial. These two books ignited a storm of controversy in the scientific establishment, but also en enabled many scientists and philosophers who had secretly harbored doubts about Darwinism to come out and articulate their critiques in print. Biochemist Michael Behe was one such scientist. For the longest time, I believe that Darwinian evolution explains what we saw in biology. Not because I saw how it could actually explain it, but because I was told that it did explain it. And in schools, I was taught Darwinian biology. And through college and graduate school, I was in an atmosphere which just assumed that Darwinian evolution explained biology. And again, I didn't have any reason to doubt it. It wasn't until about you know, 10 years or more ago that I read a book called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by a, a geneticist by the na name of Michael Denton, an Australian. And he put forward a lot of scientific arguments against Darwinian theory that I had never heard before. And, and the arguments uh, seemed pretty convincing. And at that point, I, I started to get a bit angry because I, I thought I was being led down the primrose path. Here were a number of very good arguments, and I had gone through a, a doctoral program in biochemistry, became a faculty member, and uh, I had never even heard of these things. And so from that point on, I became very interested in, in the question of evolution, and, and uh, since have decided that Darwinian uh, processes are not uh, the whole explanation for life. In 1997, Philip Johnson formed these dissenters into an intellectual movement now based at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington, that has become known as the Intelligent Design Movement. Whilst maligned and misrepresented by mainstream science today, 
The ID movement has offered compelling critiques of Darwinism and published a list of over 1,000 PhD scientists and philosophers who stated, We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. I'm skeptical of the claims. I'm skeptical. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. A careful examination of, of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Skeptical. 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 Skeptical of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for, for the complexity. Complexity. The complexity. The complexity. To account for the complexity of life. Careful examination. Examination. Examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Richard Dawkins is well aware of this movement and has spearheaded campaigns to keep any discussion of their work out of science curriculums, whilst at the same time claiming that there is no scientific controversy over evolution. Finally, Dawkins also claims that the evidence for evolution is overwhelming, claiming that you cannot be both sane and well-educated and disbelieve in evolution. The evidence is so strong that any sane, educated person has got to believe in evolution. However, on this point too, Dawkins is bluffing. If by evolution you mean simply change over time, then there is a wealth of evidence. Look at the incredible variety of dogs, for example, that have all evolved from a single wolf-like ancestor. Dawkins asks us to bear in mind this order of evolutionary change and then extrapolate backwards 20,000 times into the past. It, he says, becomes rather easy to accept that evolution could accomplish the amount of change that it took to transform a fish into a human. However, this is misleading. All of the modern varieties of dogs share an almost identical genome, and where changes have occurred, they have involved a loss of genetic information, not a gain. This is important because the grand evolutionary story, which tells us that complex life has gradually evolved from simple, single-celled life forms, requires that as time progresses, more and more genetic information is generated. Think about the genetic instructions for how to build a wing, an eye, or a spinal cord. Where did the information come from? You may be surprised to hear that Darwinists have no idea. Mutations were Darwin's favoured solution, but it turns out that all the mutations we have observed delete information rather than adding it. According to Israeli biologist Lee Spetner, all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. Dawkins was famously lost for words on this point as the infamous 11 second pause video shows. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? However, even if we grant that Dawkins' memory may have failed him on that occasion, it should be noted that, even in his written work, Dawkins offers little data to support the claim that mutations can generate new information. In his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution, Dawkins points to the Lensky experiment, which is the biggest lab experiment on evolution to date. 
In this ongoing experiment, which began in February 1988 and is being conducted by bacteriologist Richard Lensky at the Mich Michigan State University, 12 different flasks, called tribes, of the same strain of E. coli bacteria have been bred in the hope of observing evolution in action. One tribe suddenly acquired the ability to feed on citrate rather than glucose only. Dawkins explains that glucose was not the only nutrient in the broth. Another one was citrate, related to the substance that makes lemons sour. The broth contained plenty of citrate, but E. coli normally can't use it, at least not when there is oxygen in the water. But if a mutant could discover how to deal with citrate, a bonanza would open up to it. This is exactly what happened to Ara 3. This tribe and this tribe alone suddenly acquired the ability to eat citrate as well as glucose rather than only glucose. Dawkins claims that this is evolution before our very eyes, saying that not only does it show evolution in action, it shows new information entering genomes without the intervention of a designer. However, as Dawkins' own words show, the bacteria already possessed the transporter genes that allow it to digest citrate in oxic conditions. Thus, no new information was required for this mutation. Lensky himself noted, a more likely possibility, in our view, is that an existing transporter has been co-opted for citrate transport under oxic or high oxygen levels conditions. In summary then, Dawkins claims that opponents of Darwinism are uneducated or ignorant, that no scientific controversy exists over evolution, and that the evidence for evolution is overwhelming, are false. Dawkins is deliberately bluffing about these claims in order to prevent the general public from questioning Darwin's theory. Part two of this series will show how Darwinism is based on naturalistic philosophy rather than science. This is Dan Stone. Please see my website swallowingtheredpill.com for more information.